<clears throat> While all of the other creatures collected eating beans, there was on one planet a creature who began to also who began to also gather invisible beans, or as the first noted group referred to them as non-existent legumes. <laughs> anyway, anyway. This second mentioned creature took up the habit of collecting what he called beans, but which no one, including him, could see or eat. Well, sir, I think from just this little bit of information, you can put the conclusion to this little story. I mean, where it's headed and what its obvious moral will be couldn't be plainer, now could it? That is, if you'd pay attention and quit playing with those beans. It's always nice to start off with an easy news item. <laughs> or at night, it are. Everything that's going on is going on in two separate ways. If it is really going on, then it is going on physically. But if men think it to be going on, then it is also doing so in their mind. Two separate things. Not just different, but separate and a distinction that must be recognized for freedom to be realized. On one world, the soul health fact extant is the following. If you think about illness, you'll never be well. Never. Meanwhile, back here on earth, if heartless is, as words define, then those concerned dream lemmings fly. The speaker yelled out to the crowd, What do most people talk about? And they yelled back, Themselves! And the speaker yelled at them again, And what's the only thing that most people seem qualified to talk about? And the crowd yelled back again, Themselves! And then the speaker screamed at them, And what does this show that they know about themselves? And then the crowd was stumped. <laughs> A boy said to his father, do humans ask too many questions? Not so much a matter of too many questions as too many answers, he replied. Our minds do not direct our lives. Our bodies do not direct our lives. Life directs our lives. And none but the mind see it otherwise. In a self-serving action, need I note? The inner states that the few have long referred to as captive, the inner state that the few have long referred to as captive is sustained by the perception of mental activity being properly tripartite in nature, of it consisting of the thinker, the thing thought about, and the act of thinking. A classification that seems to add to knowledge, but contributes naught to understanding, and in fact is viscidly distracting vis-a-vis -vis freedom. Two jackals were talking and one of them said, How did humans get to be on top and have it so easy, when we're still out here living with the fleas, running from the weather, and eating whatever we can get our paws on? And the other one replied, it's because humans live in two different worlds simultaneously. And the first jackal scratched his head and said, you can't tell it from looking. And the second one replied, I know. That's the weird part. <laughs> when you have but one job, you need but one intelligence. But to get anywhere in this solar system, you got to do better than that. Having creatures who can move in two directions at once has proven a boon for the herd. Yet a few individuals find this situation intolerably distracting. Those who talk for a living, that is, whose lives are dependent on talk, find everything adequately covered once the topics of health, feelings, and finances have been noted. What then, goose yourself, does this leave those wishing for unnatural freedom to discuss about? Other than in such areas as the debate over contemporary colloquial use of prepositions as conclusions of sentences. 
So, you want to talk about talk, okay? So, you want to see a football kick a football, eh? <laughs> so, you still expect to wake up while thinking and talking about it. My blood pressure is down today. I'm not currently mad at anybody. And I've got a comfortable nest egg sliced away. What more could I ask for? What other freedoms are there to discuss about? <laughs> so, take your footballs, your prepositional positioning, and all of your talk about talk, and leave me the hell alone to live my life as I will be forced to live it anyway. No matter what I say. The notion of planning for the future helps sustain the illusion that there is such a thing. And now, another hint for the heavily handicapped. You'll be no more awake tomorrow than you were yesterday. Another neat thing about those seeking enlightenment is that the only, they only have one chance. Always, continually, and relentlessly. Just one chance. And you can just guess when that is. When pushed under specific conditions regarding a particular problem, men will admit that it probably doesn't do any good to worry about it. For what they cannot see is that it does no good to think about it, period. Since all human problems are products of thought. Reality. There are with humans, in fact, two realities. One of silence and one of talk. Headline. In re clarity and good sight. If you stare at the sky, clouds will form. <laughs> the reason that those amongst the ordinary who are considered the most intelligent prefer physical science over all the alternative forms is because men are less inclined to error in their knowledge of the external world than they are in that of their internal one. For your historical information, the very first and worldwide name for the attempt to achieve enlightenment was the shut-up medicine. Once upon a time, a man suddenly awoke and exclaimed, I am amazed to realize that part of me has been residing in China and another part of me living in Brazil. All of these years, and I never realized it, taking myself to be one. Much now is clear to me, which for long had been cloudy. Why take sleeping potions when shut-up cures are available? Ordinarily, People either identify who they are with their body or with their thoughts, commonly called their personality. This leaves but the few who seek to separate themselves from such attachments and simply live their lives as they come to pass, same as everyone else, but without the burden of picturing themselves as something like this or something like that. <laughs> Only those who do not know what man is call themselves by a particular name. <clears throat> the unidentified silent no whenever he was about to have a thought one man would say to himself no turn to page 221 instead <laughs> one mystic's hint to a friend when trying to make plans for tomorrow when trying to make plans for tomorrow begins to make you ill, I suggest that you're getting close. Attempting the impossible is something the knowledgeable can use to profit, while staying entangled with the non-existent is something of no value, no matter how you turn it. First, you get over being irritated with the external world. Then you get irritated on a higher level at your own internal talk about changing the external world. When you're free, you then realize that even the teensiest bit of criticism thoughts have of life make chains of captivity the size of the universe. 
Headline, regarding the two matters of knowledge and thought. Talk equals knowledge. Knowledge equals talk. Thus, knowledge equals nothing. Good humor towards one's own inner life can cast out a million more demons a million times faster than the world's best exorcists. A man who cannot use being annoyed to his advantage is, in the end, no real man at all. Headline, Twin Recognitions and Definitions. The Grand Illusion, Knowledge. The Great Illusion Disseminator, Talk. Since this universe is a whole, it cannot dance with itself. For that, it produced a creature who thinks man. And thus the dance began. One self-discovered prisoner would thus remind himself, if you can't seem to presently stop and shut up, you can at least slow down. This is always possible, he'd say to himself. And always appropriate, my struggle. In that internal talk-filled world, the busier a man, the more entrapped he be. And the busier be a busy man, the less awareness ever has he of his confinement. Birds in cages stay unrebellious by being bedazzled by mirrors. Those seeking enlightenment must not mistake the pleasures of the mind for profits of the mind, for there are none. One man's wrestled language down to this spot on the mat. Words are good for two purposes only. One is to explain to others my experiences, and secondly is to tell them, tell them what I know that is profitable, which is that Words are meaningless with the two exceptions just noted. One man has this one simple rule he currently lives by. Don't be glutinous. <laughs> and as long as we're at it, there's another man who goes by this one. Never state a rule you live by if other people aren't going to understand it. <laughs> Maybe we could promote a grudge match between those two in Vegas or some other equally sticky place. <laughs> a man said to a mystic, it must be neat knowing more than everyone else. In fact, I guess knowing everything there is to know. To which the alleged one replied, which is the same thing as knowing nothing once you realize the nature of knowledge. A boy asked his father, why don't more people try to talk to mystics personally? I think you know the answer to that, he replied. <laughs> once a man with clear vision knows that whatever he preaches to you, once a man with clear vision knows that whatever he preaches to you is what? <laughs> Only. A man with clear vision knows that whatever he preaches to you is wasted based upon him already realizing the same regarding himself. We will not take the time to point out the irony. There was once a man seeking that special freedom who decided that what might put him over the top in his efforts would be to compose one long sentence that contained within it every word in the dictionary. I cannot give you the ending to this story since nothing was ever heard from this man after that. <laughs> and now a brand new theory concerning conspiracy theories. Everyone's convinced that something unknown is controlling everything. But no one knows what it is. Of course, there's still always a few people here and there who aren't an internal part of everyone. So in their case, the structural integrity of the Sands, Trump Tower, and the MGM Grand must be re-examined. Why leave to chance your understanding of what's running everything? Hmm? 
Hmm? I feel like I've suddenly moved very near just between Hiroshima and Nagasaki. <laughs> this entry from our secret poo-poo dictionary. <laughs> An intellectual mystic. One who knows more and more and more about the fact that there is nothing to knowledge. As to where this might profitably end, the tome does not indicate. The pleasures of mental acquisitions are not to be denied, but they should be recognized for what they are. Salted peanuts and potato chips. As his physical feel of the experience began to deepen, one man started referring to his inner commentaries regarding enlightenment as my special little fancy wancy wordies. <laughs> <laughs> the pseudo complexity of inner bondage the same as binds the many frees the few as soon as they learn what to do thought judgmental is at its busiest thought most active most restrictive Today's question, why have a poor opinion of yourself when you can have none? <laughs> the liberated mind is like a flashlight that eats its own batteries. Oh, today's other question, why suffer from low self-esteem when you can suffer from no self at all? <laughs> The speaker expand, expounded, the personal lives of awakened men read like a joke. And one of his listeners called out, but isn't a joke on those who pursue such worthless tales? A comment in reaction to which the speaker dropped into momentary, apparently silent reflection. Finally replying, well, yeah, but... Geez, I had no idea you people were actually paying any attention to what I was saying. So the voice in the crowd yelled back, then this time, I guess the joke's on you. And as everyone was having a hearty laugh at his perceived expense, the speaker spread that special inflammable fluid over all of the neurons in his brain that were participating in the above covered scene as he simultaneously reminded himself that whenever you talk, especially to yourself, the joke, whether realized or not, is always on you. <laughs> the ultimate lesson regarding talk is that, even though it never gets you anywhere you want to go, its activity can so camouflage the fact that you're likely to take the noise for the achievement. There's nowhere else to go and no extraordinary times yet to arrive. The air you breathe when you go in a trance is the same you inhale when you revive. Tis normal and harmless, the routine to dream, but those seeking freedom by doing so stay trapped. I guess you could say that an enlightened man is what everyone else is in those momentary unnoticed gaps between their thoughts. I guess you could if you wanted to. To pay attention to time is to never awake and be free. Headline, on those worlds which have thought. Where the sun rises and where the sun sets, that's where to be. That's where to be. What is so, so easy to forget amidst all the noise of our talking is that the very same energy that brought about our birth is the exact same energy that moves us to awaken. What other force is there?
Another one of those special laws applicable only to those special few people. Anything you want, you can't get. <laughs> to some, the grandest of attainment is the loss of all knowledge. And finally, how much simpler need we see it? If you didn't talk, you'd be awake. And uh, in response to a request uh, that came in for a clarification of the Grumerian method, uh, I'll try one more time. Perhaps this time a diagram will help. brain, the lungs. It's this. You hold thought still as you inhale and you let the breath pass by the unmoving brain, the unmoving mind as it would seem, to refresh and in fact encourage a new state of awareness. That's it. Now surely that will, people don't write me anymore about it. That's the Grumerian method and it's, it should be quite plain to everyone. Uh, what a lot of tonight was about, I guess you may have noticed, was uh, I guess some of you might see is not dissimilar to that which is represented, to, represented by the Grumerian method. That is the whole idea of uh, some other state of awareness. By the way, is anybody, I'll bring it up for you on your behalf. Even though I continue to do it, to complain about descriptions or to just to simply point out that any description that becomes habitual, that you feel as though that you're now comfortable with and etc you should finally take note of before it's too long and abandon it and uh, even though I saw no great profit originally in trying to make up new terms for another state of consciousness you can call it just another state of consciousness or awareness but uh, even you and me now continue to use the time honored terms about being enlightened, being awakened, and it all, the descriptions fit. And of course, those of you who are getting good, you know that that doesn't prove a damn thing since all descriptions fit. <laughs> when you're dealing in a made up world to say, well, there must be some validity to this because it makes sense. <laughs> Get real. <laughs> it's like, you know, there must be life after death because I cannot imagine there not being. And somebody says, well, I can. There you go. I, I, I know it didn't seem to go over well, but when you're going to take your chance one way or the other with the mind, perhaps you should re-examine the operations of the MGM grind, the Sands, Trump Tower. I thought recovering it would add much to it. I would suggest, even though I didn't make this one up either, is really at least at this juncture, the actual best description other than the kind of the generic one of trying to achieve another state of awareness or another state of consciousness, to, tr to try and say something more specific, uh, I would suggest this particular night that the best is actually to say to be free or to be liberated, which is at least as old as the other two. But if you just say to be free, well, the point is... Uh, if you discuss it a bit or if you just thought about it on your own, the idea, uh, again, that they're all equally as ancient and honored, but uh, to say that men ordinarily live in the dark, but through certain kinds of efforts they can be enlightened. It's as though they step from a darkened area into the light. That seems to make perfect sense and the same one that, that says that we normally, that men normally are living in a state of sleep and through some sort of unusual methods that a person can awaken from this sleep.
both of those from a certain view have far too much to do or appear to have far too much to do with knowledge. That that is that to be, to step out of the dark gives you new information, that you see things in your way. And you can certainly carry those allegories to uh, very pleasurable extremes of the mind that apparently explain many things, that we have lived in the dark and we mistook that which we saw because the light was not true, it did not give a valid picture, or we can say that we do live as though in a state of semi-sleep, that we're staggering around, bumping into things, not seeing things as they are, and that we can awaken. But in both instances, the awakening and the enlightenment, if you're following what I'm saying tonight, it's not the only way, but from one view, it does seem to hint or seem to be based upon or tied to knowledge in a way in which I would suggest is not ultimately of great use. Whereas if you just say that the state itself, if you call it rather than being enlightened or awakened, if you said you're free, then you're left with this, translating the way you want to. That each person is free then, you can say, well, free to do what? You know, hey, you get free, don't bug me with it. <laughs> that was either dramatic sarcasm or real sarcasm. That is, if you got free, if you achieved this other state internally, and then, then you're free, then you can do it, you can call it anything you want to. You can then consider, and well-foundedly so, you can consider in advance that you will be free to do anything you want to. That whatever it was, or put another way, whatever you dream now, assuming it has, anyway, whatever a, a person dreamed who was wired up to pursue <coughs> such as this, whatever your dream, whatever your imagination would be of being more awake or enlightened, then you will be free to experience it. And so freedom is actually the best word. You understand? Because there is no limitation then. You can say, well, free to be smarter? Yeah, okay. Free to be dumber? Yeah. <laughs> free to not care? Yeah. Free to be more concerned about your fellow man? Sure. <laughs> free to not think too much about it? Yeah. Free to direct my thoughts more? Oh, yeah. Free, free to have some control over my mind, yeah? Free to be able to cut it off, yeah? Or if I can't cut it off, freedom not to carry more? Yeah, that. So there you are. But the idea that got stuck into four or five news items, uh, the one I didn't pull out was the uh, liberated mind is like a flashlight that eats its own batteries. Let me just read them all again. The pseudo-complexity of inner bondage. And I wrote that in consideration that I would bring up the idea of being free as the tonight's operational description. So the headline of this one was a two-page news item. The pseudo-complexity of inner bondage. The same as binds the many frees the few. Thought judgmental is at its busiest. Thought most active, most restrictive. There's nowhere else to go and no extraordinary times yet to arrive. The air you breathe when you go into a trance is the same you inhale when you revive. On those worlds which have thought, where the sun shines and where the sun sets, that's where to be, that's where to be. And what is so, oh so easy to forget amidst all the noise of us talking, even about it being free, is that the very same energy that brought about our birth is the exact same energy that moves us to awaken. What other force is there? Which I got to admit, even for Monday, if you're following it, is pushing even the best attempted, best intended talk about other states of awareness right up to the very edge to where there's almost nothing else to say. But there is, I'll try it again, not being the first nor the last, surely. But if there is any I don't mean this literally, but if there's any real deceptive trick in being alive and being conscious, if there really was a conspiracy in some way 
to keep men from changing their state, which there's not. But if there was, it would be this. That only the few people who are wired up in such a way that they have always believed and continue to pop up in the genetics of life on this planet, the human life, that there is some other possible state internally that no one else seems to know about and it seems impossible to get your hands on and yet you can hear other descriptions. You can hear descriptions other people have made such as men live in the dark but they can live in the light. And you go, yeah. Perhaps you had to read something a bit more detailed and maybe allegorical. But you hear it and you go, yes, yes, yes. There is no doubt in your mind, none whatsoever, that something extraordinary is possible and that people have absolutely experienced it and as soon as you read it, whatever one you found originally, but as soon as you read about it, one way or the other, from some era, from some area, it just strikes you. Even after all that distance and all that time and coming off the printed page, that you read it and you go, yes, that's it. The unseen captious, I hate to call it a flaw, but problem, challenge that the mind cannot directly see is this. Even after you're convinced it's true, you never think about, you never analyze, you never question, but what? Whatever the information is, is at least outside the mainstream. The classics being, of course, secret knowledge and hidden and blah, blah, blah. Even after you may have heard it said or Later on, you hear it said, or you read somewhere else, that someone says that the idea of secret knowledge and there being knowledge somewhere that's being hidden from you, that's far removed from you, is not true. That whatever it is you're looking for is in you. You probably read that at the same time you read the first description, but it may take you 20 years or more to digest it, for it to strike you again, and it'll be as though you read it for the first time. And that seems to be a certain amount of functional release, if not useful info, that after these years of trying to find the secret information pouring through books, going from guru to pillar to guru, that you finally go back and read that what it is you're looking for is in you. And you may think, well, I've read it before, but I always took it metaphorically. Wait a minute. Maybe this time you read it and it says this is not a metaphor. And some guy 4,000 years ago, he says, if you read this later, in the United States 4,000 years from now, may I point out to you, this is not a friggin' metaphor. What you're looking for, if you think of it as being knowledge and something that you obtain, it is nowhere else except in you. Please note, this is no metaphor. Yours truly, I'm dying now, see you later. <laughs> so this time you read it, and it appears, you, you feel a reality to it. And you will likewise feel that uh, it is a most useful piece of realization now because it explains, for one thing, why you have been unable to find adequate external help or external information. Mm -hmm. That if this is true, and it, as I said, once you, if it does strike you eventually, then you realize that you have been reading it, everything that you read that you thought was important or having to do with knowledge and that you needed that was not readily available, it will, at the same time that you begin to, that this strikes you, it will similarly, similarly strike you that you have been reading those same words for 20 or 30 years or a lifetime and just didn't realize it. And so it seems as though you have gone over a major hurdle that you went from a metaphorical interpretation of something that you now feel the inclination to take literally. That you read someone saying, even thousands of years ago, thousands of miles from where you are, that the, what you're looking for is in you and nowhere else. Please note this is no allegory, no metaphor. So it feels as though you're making real progress. Uh, if you insist, well, for the sake of talk, yeah, it's some kind of progress. If you didn't get unstuck from the first idea, then you would never get anywhere else. So we'd have to admit it's some sort of progress. But back to what I was saying is the almost indecipherable maybe a mental trompe-l'oeil 
you just almost can't see it. You look right at it, and it's this. There is nothing, not only hidden in some other part of the world from you, there is nothing in you hidden from you. I ask you again, where is it going to hide? Or put another way, if there is, let's try it this way. It is very common to describe energies running life. Uh, oftentimes people who become interested in such as this and attempt to think in a non-literal manner in life and speculate upon the nature of life uh, even begin to refer to knowledge as some sort of energy, some sort of force in the universe. When the mind uses those terms though in the so-called mystical fashion the mind is, as always, putting the force, putting the energy outside of you. Because if the energy was part of you, if the force was part of you, then you would not be searching for it. That is the trompe l'oeil. People believe we even talk this way. Even I talk this way and write sometimes. I talk about being wired up to do this and people in interest to do this. And so it would be... Not unusual has been done throughout the years of someone to speak of a particular form of energy driving people who are interested in this other state, in this freedom. That there is another kind of energy. It just seems self-evident without it even being judgmental in a discriminatory fashion to say, well, most people, most ordinary people are driven by just the desires and pleasures of the body. All they ask for is the, you know, good food, a little sex, uh, enough money that they don't have to kill themselves, some nice rest. And that's it. That that is that is the extent of the energy. That that energy is available to everyone. That even would be mystics have that same energy. It's running through them. But then it seems to be, as I said, self-evident that there is something special about people who are interested in this and rather than just say there's something special you could say well there is obviously some motivating energy there is something driving people that are interested in this that do not drive the common man again not that being once you see well at any rate it's not discriminatory not better or worse just take it on the basis that you look at it or think about it and you think well there has to be there has to be. I mean, you don't even, it's not worthy of much reflection. That there is something driving me, even if I can't name it right now, but there is something driving me, and you might be to the point now of understanding enough out of the ordinary, or your view of understanding is enough out of the ordinary, that you can even read the words of dead men from thousands of years ago, and you recognize people that were driven by similar non-standard energies. That you can read a Jesus or an Abraham or Moses and etc. And all kinds of obscure figures. And you can read it and it just strikes you. You have no doubt there is a kindred spirit. That if this guy or woman was alive now and we could speak the same language, we would understand each other. We would recognize each other just after a few words. We could talk for a few minutes and we would understand that we're both being driven by the same thing. We would understand that neither one of us has any... The ordinary interests of the flesh, as religion would call it, are not wrong, but that do not satisfy you. That no matter how much you eat, no matter how much you drink, no matter how much sex you are involved with, no matter how, how easy you have life, that you have a fluffier and fluffier pillow, that none of it will suit you. So you realize that you are driven, it would appear, without any question, by some special energy. That is a damn lie. Where is this energy? The news on the night was several of them, if you now can recall the ones I just read again. The very energy, the way I wrote it, one was the very energy. What is so easy to forget amidst all the noise of us talking about being free is that the very same energy that brought about our birth. The reason I picked it out that way is what could be more mundane and common than that. The very same energy that brought about our birth is the exact same energy that moves us to awaken. 
Uh, I was about to say I was going to, to try and put this as commonly as possible because what I'm pointing at couldn't be more commoner, mm -hmm. which is always hard to point out something that is the poster boy or the defining picture of the word and to use it as the defining picture of the word. It's like showing a mirror a mirror and say, all right, here's what you are. Does it? I keep using that. I don't, you can't show a mirror a mirror and say, would you like to know what you are? In the mirror, you should know what I represents so-called human mind, thought. And you say, would you like to know what you are? And of course, people attempting to do this always believe. Because thought is, eventually you have to see the operations that we call thought, the talking part of man, not the silent part, which would be the body put crudely, but the talking part of man would appear to be the thing against which you're struggling. That is man's inner life. To get past all the fancy misleading words of spirit and soul and etc. You could call it spirit or soul, but to say that man has emotions and spirit and soul and a mind and an intellect, uh, you have just You have popealed the thing to death. <laughs> you have cut it up. You've diced it into so many pieces you'll never see anything. Which again, if you hadn't noticed, is part of the mind's normal process. It doesn't understand it. It does no harm but to continually divide things up to such a point that there's no chance of realizing that it doesn't know what it's doing. That if you say you don't know what you're doing, to the mind, the mind go, and you point the examples, you say, well, here's an easy thing. I see it. It's one whole thing that you've been looking at for these thousands of years, and you've cut it up into ten different pieces. No wonder you can't see it. And you point to the mind and go, hmm. You know what the mind just did if it listened to you? It just made it 11. <laughs> that is your attack. And of course, if you go, wait a minute, I heard what you did. I was trying to point out something to you for you to try for you to see that you keep cutting everything up into so many pieces. That's one way that you deal with not looking at it. To sing it as a whole since you can't see it. And therefore you just keep as sometimes uh, usually in a attack mode is one of the uh, negative views of science. The division into smaller and smaller specialized compartments. It's based on a little reality but I mean, it's criticism, it gets you nowhere. But it's to actually see that the mind does continually cut things up over and over and over. And if you point it out to the mind, and in one area, if you just point out to the mind, here's your problem, the thing you're looking at, that you call whatever, morality, religion, personality. All right, you know what you call it, and the mind goes, yeah. You go, all right, it's a one thing. It's a one thing, it's a whole, and you have cut it up, the best I can tell in your particular case, into ten pieces. And the mind goes, hmm. There's 11. And you go, I just saw that. Now it's 11. And it goes, really? Now it's 12. Uh, there is no way that the mind can escape the fact, to begin with, that if there's something, that whatever it is driving someone to do this, uh, you don't, after a short period of time, you do not need a sermon, you do not need someone to say, Assuming you hadn't gone crazy over it already, which I'll assume none of you people hearing this have. It's not really necessary to point out after you attempt to find some useful information, some practical support for what you're doing. Then if that doesn't drive you up the wall, turn you into a maniac, get you all hostile, turn you into trying to be a leader in the great search for awakening. In other words, if you survive it all fairly intact, uh, you're still left with this, that there seems to be no common support for what you're doing, that you look around and you realize, well, what I'm looking for, even if I don't know exactly what it is, I have now ascertained. I am well read enough. I have looked far enough in a fairly impartial manner that I recognize now from all the great books of the Western world, of the Eastern world, of all religions, of all colloquial, conventional wisdom, I do not see a direct response, a direct piece of information or informations that would feed my hunger. So therefore the idea, even if you never express it, the idea is there that there's an energy driving 
the motivation for people to awaken, achieve enlightenment, to be free, that is out of the mainstream, to say the least. And it's not true. There is but one energy. There is but one universe. Every idea that there is something special driving this just keeps you where you are. There was another news item that said uh, in regard to thought on planets that have thought, on worlds that have thought. And it says where the sun rises and where the sun sets is where you should be. It would be expected by now that people would be involved with seeing what is rising within themselves, the kinds of thoughts, useless thoughts. You know, let's all give ourselves credit that at least you've gotten down to the point of useless. That at least you're not in a passionate manner fighting a tar beaver that you'll, on the basis that certain thoughts are uh, despicable, that certain thoughts are destructive, and a hindrance to awakening as opposed to other thoughts that might be less so. Let's just assume that you got it to the point that you realize that the runnings of the mind in general, without even without wasting your time trying to be specific, but just what normally goes on when you're breathing and you're not holding the mind still. Every time you breathe, the mind is just as active as the molecules bouncing around inside your lungs. That the busy mind is the confining mind. The busy mind is the captive mind. A few nights ago, if you didn't hear it, I did one about a man looking out at all the slave labor. I didn't say a man. I said the, the slave master looking out over those working his field and seeing how busy they were, nodded approvingly to himself and said, well, you know, a busy man is a man that's not going anywhere. And then he went on by his other business. That's another view of life as, we, as men normally live it. That the busier the mind is, and you take no account of it, the busier it is, the less chance you've got of ever seeing what it is. And it doesn't matter. It can be busy reading books about being non-busy. It can be reading books about being more awake. And the more books you read, the less chance you've got, which is just another way of saying the more you think about it, the further away you are from it, if that's possible, which is not. But you're, you can't see it. You're staying right in front of this trompe l'oeil, this captive challenge of the mind, by believing that there is an energy outside what's going on now. But the same energy, well, I'll put it to you another way. Where there was a news item here that was a, when I read it, it seemed to, I had the impression it went over even less well than some of the others. There's nowhere else to go and no extraordinary times yet to arrive. And then was this little four-line kind of verse that said, the air you breathe when you go in a trance is the same you inhale when you revive. When you feel as though, as far as you're concerned, that if right now if I say, well, everybody can, you just stop thought, just become impartially conscious of consciousness, aware of awareness, just everything sort of stops, everything does stop internally. And then I can say, is that not extraordinary, even though you can do it? Is that not extraordinary? And you go, yes, because it is not man's ordinary condition. It's no one's ordinary condition. No one is born that way. There are no natural sons of God. That is, there are no people who are born doing that. Because you're born at first in a trance, in the dark, asleep. You're born in a normal state of consciousness. But then if I say, well, you can stop it right now, or at least you can interfere with it. And it's a totally different state that you sit there and do with making no exotic efforts other than to intend to do it, and you do it. And then if nothing else is said, you, you assume, well, even though I can do it, it's, it's, it's a whole different, it feels different, it's a different experience. And if I say, well, if I just went ahead and if I say, well, it's obvious then in some way we can tap into a different, extraordinary flow of energy. Would you not go, yeah, yeah. Would you not? Because now I could also say, well, it's obvious. That's why you must stop and do it, why it takes a willful effort. Because the ordinary energy available to man that drives not only his body, 
but his so-called mind, his consciousness, this is, in, it, it just drowns, it pushes, it drags along everyone equally. And it takes into account not at all the individual. It does not take into account an individual's perception of life, his understanding. That becomes an individual's effort if one undertakes it at all. It is a strictly singular activity which in some way you have got to be able to plug into a new flow of energy because it's obvious the ordinary one won't do it or else you, would, you wouldn't have to do it yourself, right? And you go, yeah. So it's obviously some other form of energy, an, another level, a different, a different stream of energy. Maybe it's running parallel to this one, but it's obviously a different one, right? It is. There is only one energy. The same energy that puts you to sleep, the same energy that wakes you up. What else can it be? Well, the very thing that seems to confine from one view, or from the verbal view I've been using, which is not the only one, but that which seems to be our mode of captivity is not barbed wire, it's not physical, it's not stone walls, we're not actually slaves chained to somebody. What would seem to be the inhibiting factor is thought. Just the running mechanical thought that of course, what I've been talking about is it turns into this running commentary on life. And therefore, all you know of being alive, besides the physical, which everyone has, you and everyone else, besides that, then all you have is talk about life. You don't have a consciousness of life as it is. You have a consciousness of you talking about life, of you analyzing life, of this running, non-willful, non-specific annotation of what's going on. And that is what is called an ordinary state of consciousness. That's why it's called being asleep in the dark, captive. If that's the ordinary state, and you can stop it right now just by wanting to, then is there, there has to be some other flow of energy. It, it is not the one that puts you in that state, right? Where else is it? What else is it? But do you see, to call it a trick of the eye, to call it an illusion, to call it an attempt to make a mirror look at itself still doesn't cover it. But to believe that there is some other energy, if you look at it at the rate of the kind of scenarios I've been verbally presenting, if you looked at thought being the captivating factor, which is fair enough, but if you look at thought as being that which binds you, there is no freedom outside of thought. And you don't have to stick with that allegory. You can say, if thought is that which puts us in the dark, thought is the only source of light. Mm -hmm. If thought is that which puts you asleep, thought is the only thing that will awaken you. Again, the idea itself, that presentation is not new. But you can believe that you hear that and not hear it. Because if you hear it in the mind, trust me, you don't hear it. To say, well, let's use the one asleep. That picture for a minute. Well, any of them. Captivity. If thought is that which makes you captive, and let's say that you've been following what I'm saying, and for the mom momentarily you accept that and you go, yeah, I can feel it, I experience it, there's no doubt that's a reasonable picturization, that it is thought that keeps me captive right now because I keep talking about life and I know I can stop the talk momentarily and perhaps I've even been in extended states of so-called enlightened freedom or awakening to where I had hours Days, that for all intents and purposes, my thoughts were irrelevant. Whatever was going on in my brain did not color what I saw, did not color my consciousness, my awareness of life non-physically, that I was conscious in a way that was not dependent on thought. So I know that. So I could look at my captivity right now. You would accept the description that thought is the factor of captivity. And you go, yeah. And then to say, all right, if thought is the captive, captain, or captivating factor, then thought is the liberating factor. See, I'm trying to do a physical. And you look off and you think about it, and I might as well have just farted, snorted, coughed, wheezed. To say, well, we are asleep because of thought. You go, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if that is true then thought is the only thing that will awaken you. 
All you got to do is, that represents that you think about it, and it won't awaken you. You can, after that, search forever for a thought that will awaken you, because then you think, well, it is knowledge. There is some thought that I have that if I have that thought, and it goes through my brain, and I say it, but you got to say it for it to be a thought, that if it goes through my brain, it will be like a mantra. It will be the great mystical abracadabra that this thought will counteract, neutralize all other thoughts. That's not what it is. That's not what it means. That to say if it is thought that has put us asleep, then it is only thought that will awaken us, and you go, well, it's got to be true, it's got to be true. No, it's not, because you thought about it. What it's really saying is, forget thought, as you could call it other things. What you've got to see is that there is only one energy. That everything that you think you're struggling against, or everything that you think is hiding from you, or everything that you think that you should be hiding from, is you. There's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to hide. There's nowhere for anything to be hidden from us. It's only thought that hides everything in that sense. But thought itself cannot embarrass itself. A mirror can't see itself. To believe that there is any kind of effort, any kind of information, any kind of thought, any kind of energy outside of whatever you got right this damn second. As long as you believe that. As long as you don't struggle to get past that. It's all real iffy. Or at least you're making it harder. The time comes that... Uh, even if you don't see it directly, I strongly suggest that you try your damnedest to at least remember it, to think about it. Because if you're going to think about anything, at least think about my thinking is an absolute waste of time. Or that whatever I'm thinking now, just this second, right this second, whatever I'm thinking now is just as conducive and just as likely to awaken me as a secret chant if I find out that uh, Muhammad of Zoroaster had a secret prayer that no one knew but him and his right hand man, and I learned what it was. Whatever you're thinking right now is just as worthy. There is no secret. There can't be a secret. There's nowhere for it to be secret. And there is no energy but whatever you're thinking now. That's the reality behind the old idea that they do, everybody likes to keep repeating that whatever it is that puts you asleep is that which will, put you, which will awaken you. And then it goes into all sorts of strange things after that that oftentimes turns into religious practices as they call it. That is, you're attempting to make amends for your sins, that in some way you're trying to take that which you have done incorrectly and not to modify it, to rectify it, that you're attempting in some way to reverse your course, to go in another direction. That uh, if, thought is, if sin is what put me here, then I've got to go in the opposite direction. The non-sin is what will get me out, which is the same thing as believing that there is some force outside yourself. Because it'd be the same thing if you believed that if you called it sin instead of thought. If you were going by some external standard, such as a religious one, and you considered that the end of it, I'm mixing up metaphors, but if you considered that the end result of being a Jew was to be awakened.